Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this conversation and happy Earth Day to all of you joining from all parts of the world. Um, as all of you know, our world is in crisis right now. While we are all doing our part to stay home and flatten the curve on coronavirus, we cannot lose sight of our global climate crisis. And we must take this Earth Day as a moment to reflect on the connections between environmental degradation and this crisis. So in the face of these challenges, I believe that we must refuse to give up hope. Instead, as young people, we must to muster up all our strength and all our minds together to move ourselves and our leaders to action. So today we are hosting a conversation, a conversation between youth climate leaders from around the world and the United Nations to build an intergenerational dialogue with a focus on the challenges and solutions ahead of us and how do we respond and how do we recover better. Uh, the UN Sec Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed joins us here today with five powerful youth voices from the youth climate movement. Our conversation, Recover Better, calling for a united response to protect people and planet, will examine our shared challenges and how global citizens of all ages and must work together to meet these challenges head on. As we mark the 50 year anniversary of Earth Day today, the time has never been more urgent to take action to fight for both human and planetary health. A bold, transformative and united global response is the only way we'll be able to flatten the curve on the coronavirus and simultaneously bend the curve on carbon emissions. With that, I'm so pleased to welcome our esteemed panel today. We have with us the UN Deputy Secretary General, Amina Mohammed, joining today's discussion. Thank you so much, DSG, for your time. We are so honored to have you. We are also thrilled to welcome youth climate leaders from around the world. We have Alexandria Villesigno from the US. She's the founder and executive director of Earth Uprising International. We have Luis. Mabulo from the Philippines. Luis is an award-winning chef, entrepreneur, farmer, public speaker, and competitive archer, and a 2019 UN Environment's Young Champion of the Earth. Anshul Tiwari from India. He's the founder and editor-in-chief of Youth Ki Awaz. Anshul Tiwari sits at the helm of India's largest content for platforms for young people to engage on social issues. Anshul was also uh, recognized as a UNITU young innovator. We have Olumide. Idowo joining from Nigeria. Olumide is the co-founder of International Climate Change Development Initiative. We also have Hugh Weldon from Ireland, who is the co-founder of Evoco, which Weldon founded together with Ahmed Muzam. This is a smartphone app which calculates users' ecological footprint based on scanned shopping receipts. So we also have Lia Namgureva joining us. She's a Ugandan climate activist and a student striker with Fridays for Future. And Lia led campaigns against plastic bags and she had drawn attention to issues like deforestation, drought and flooding in her country. Uh, so welcome, Lia. With these introductions, I'm passing the floor to our leader, the Deputy Secretary General, for her opening thoughts for all the young people watching us today. Thank you so much, Jay Athman. And today I, I would just say, um, you know, greetings to everyone everywhere, especially our climate leaders. And uh, for me today, um, I will be a follower and not a leader. Um, and we're getting used to finally uh, this new way of working, which is all very virtual. And so we could have hundreds of people, thousands of people watching us, and, and I can only see Jayathma and a couple of others. But it's fantastic to be with you. And I, I will try to be as brief as possible because I really want to hear from you um, and perhaps get a chance to ask you a couple of questions. Um, clearly, as we mark the 50 years of Earth Day, um, people talk about it being a celebration. I don't see it that way. I see that this is actually a call to action 50 years later, and we are probably worse off. And so it must be a call to action. Last year, the voices and actions of youth made a huge mark on the pushback against um, the climate crisis that we were facing. And I think that that's what we have to build on um, in order to take this forward. We promised that last year. Um, and although today we see COVID putting a pause 
on the world. It certainly hasn't put a pause on climate change. And we saw that in Vanuatu the other day with the cyclone. So I hope that what we do is take more energy from this to say, no, that pushback, we must continue to do it so that we get the right actions from government and people around the world. The prescription for COVID has been about suppressing the transmission. Sadly, that prescription has taken us out of that human interactive space, which makes it all the more difficult for us to, act, to be activists, to get out there and to do the things we're supposed to do. But it also has a downside. The side effects of this prescription are on the socioeconomic side. And that for us is even worse as we see young people uh, <clears throat> will be a larger part of the 195 million jobs that are likely to be lost over the next three months. The SG sees that we must act in three areas. First, we must stop the transition. Absolutely urgent, it's an emergency. We must stop the transmission of the virus. The second is that we must look at the stimulus packages that have been put in place for um, the developed world to be as, as, uh, as robust for the developing world. So what is good for the goose is good for the gander. And that's what we need to see in uh, filling the liquidity spaces that are needed um, to make sure that we have enough money to deal with the socioeconomic crisis where people will be out of a job, where we'll be looking at the informal sector in developing countries, um, and where certainly we will be trying to make sure that people don't have to have a choice between um, hunger and a disease. We should be addressing both. Um, the third is that in this crisis, we should take profit of opportunities. And that means we must start thinking about the building back better. And building back better, certainly for climate action, is incredibly important. We need to make sure that we keep the climate action on the front burner and the actions that we can take today through ensuring that our NDCs produce proper investment pipelines um, in industry transition, energy transitions, nature-based solutions, everything that we need for climate action, we should take profit of. And we should see this in the stimulus packages um, and take profit from an opportunity to help inform what we spend that money on. Um, and the SG has proposed six concrete related actions. I would say that all of them come under one phrase because I don't want to go through all of it, uh, save some time. It's about the green transitions. Whether we do it with taxes, we do it with jobs, we do it with investing in the future, we look at risk, or we see the partnerships that will be determined by that. It is about a green transition, moving from gray or brown, whatever the dark color is, to a brighter green color. Um, I, I would ask that you know all of you really take opportunity to take to the streets online, because there are no streets anymore to go on for the time being. Uh, your voice needs to be heard. It's a new way of interacting. And how creative can you be? For that, I'm sure you will produce some, some incredible opportunities. Bringing solutions. That voice needs to bring solutions. Just uh, the other day, it was, uh, we were looking at people who were, co were inventing ventilators in Brazil, in Nigeria, in Uganda. And all of these were, were being done in a really environmentally friendly way. So you are bringing solutions today. Use Earth Day to hold our leaders to account. Um, and maybe, as I heard you read some of the resumes of one of our climate leaders, I would say to Louise, please don't shoot, not with your arrows. <laughs> But thank you very much. And I really look forward to hearing your questions and, and this interactive session. Thank you so much, DSG. And your call to action to young people to take the digital streets and, and do the protest and demonstrations in the digital streets really links very well to our next youth speaker, uh, Anshul, who has been doing this for years. His platform, Youth Ki Awaz, I think in Hindi translate into the voice of youth. I watched a lot of Indian movies growing up. So Anshul, this is uh, your chance to share your reflections. Thank you so much, Yadam, and I am so glad that the DSG shared that young people need to start speaking up and that their voice needs to matter. Um, I started my journey when I was 17, that is 12 years ago, uh, and I, I, I started because I realized something very early on, that young people in countries like India grew up in a culture of silence and forced upon us by the status quo. Um, and over the last 12 years, through my work of building the subcontinent's largest completely crowdsourced media platform with a sharp focus on social issues, uh, I have actually learned that if enough young people come together to speak up, which is very similar to what the DSG said, if we together use our digital platforms to really uh, have a voice and create a voice for ourselves 
and especially those who do not have the privilege of the platforms that we do, uh, then we are definitely sure that we can, we can create a change. The story of climate change uh, in the Indian subcontinent is very similar, completely marred by a culture of silence. We haven't had the opportunity to really act on it for a very long time. But young people, especially over the last year, have said that not anymore. We don't want to take this anymore. We want action. We want policies. We want dialogue. So through our uh, work, what we are trying to do, Jayatma, is that we're trying to build a youth movement in India where young campaigners, young people from across the country are able to understand the climate policy framework a lot better and ask for strengthening of it so that businesses as well as governments do not get away with just mediocre policies. And we strengthen our policy framework to make sure that we're able to deliver on our commitments that we've made globally. Thank you very much, Anshul. And someone who's doing this similar work in the African continent is Olumide. Olumide, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. I'm so glad to have this platform to also share a little bit of what is going on in Africa. And this is a, uh, a I'm really, really, you know, uh, grateful. And thanks to the DSG and uh, thanks to everyone on the platform that have been doing great work. Majorly, I just want to talk about uh, things I've been doing uh, with different kind of colleagues across Africa, which uh, is called Climate Wednesday. This is a platform that has been uh, hosting different diverse young people, even uh, that talks in different ways that is focusing on developmental issues. And with this, we've been able to actually gather the voices of young people whereby they were able to discuss what is affecting them, both locally, nationally, and even in, their fa in the family. So it's, it has been a, a great uh, platform that we've been able to use it to uh, drive policy advocacy. We've been able to use it to make sure that the government listen to young people, especially the children and youth. And this platform has also been able to get to a different kind of, uh, uh, stages whereby government is calling for our support to help them to identify problems locally, to also help them to see how they can come on board to support these kind of vulnerable people. And uh, for this purpose, we've been able also to use it to drive community actions, whereby we identify environmental issues that have been going on locally, and to also make sure that we make the government accountable for what they need to do for people to actually see that so many things is going on. Looking at the uh, geopolitical zones in Nigeria, we have the Southwest that we have a lot of flooding issues. Young people are talking about it using the social media. We have the, uh, the northern part that we have the desert encroachment. We have lots of issues that is going on there. And we have the south-south, where we have the, um, the Niger Delta, the oil spillage issue that is causing all our fresh waters not to be able to drink. And even agriculture is very hard for them to go through. So this platform has been able to engage a lot of young people and bring a lot of people on board to actually have their voice and to talk about what they want to see in the nearest future because we need to talk about it now. Like I said, climate change is a time bomb. If we don't take action now, it's going to dealt with our younger generation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Olumide. From India to Nigeria, and then in the pre-COVID era, if you walked by the United Nations on a Friday, you will see a 14-year-old girl with the climate strikes sign with her hands in front of the UN protesting. That's Alexandria Villiseño. Alexandria, now you have the opportunity to do your protest online with the Deputy Secretary General. The floor is yours. Thank you, and thank you everyone for having me here. Um, I hope that everybody is staying safe during this current pandemic. So I'm Alexandria Villasenor. I'm a 14-year-old climate activist from the United States. I first began taking climate action as part of the Fridays for Future movement, where in December of 2018, I began a weekly climate strike in front of the United Nations headquarters in New York City. So it's been nearly a year and a half since then, and I'm still striking every Friday, although now I'm striking digitally due to the coronavirus pandemic. Um, I've also be, been a lead organizer for the four global climate strikes over the past year. And through my organizing, I learned that the main reason that youth weren't taking action on the climate crisis is because they didn't know about it. So lack of education is the greatest barrier to climate action. So this inspired me to begin my nonprofit organization, Earth Uprising International, 
where youth are now taking ownership and responsibility to teach each other, each other um, about climate justice and climate science. So when we educate each other, we're making sure we center those communities who are the most affected by the climate crisis. And these are the most often communities of color. So we're also focusing on the global south where we see where we're seeing some of the greatest effects of climate change happening right now. When we educate youth on the climate crisis, they go on to take action locally and globally and positive change happens. So that is what I'm fighting for for this next year. Thank you for Thank you me. so much. Thanks, Alex. And I think the work that you have done also really links well with what Olumide and um, Anshul themselves spoke about, the digital platforms to raise youth voices on climate action. And I remember last year, you were lending your platform to young people from countries who couldn't protest or protesting was illegal. You lended your platforms to those young people to raise their voices as well. So thank you so much for so that solidarity uh, that the youth climate movement has shown. Um, I think it's a good lesson to leaders, world leaders today as well. Um, with that, we are jumping to Ireland. Uh, we have Hugh Weldon joining us from Ireland. Hey, thanks very much for the opportunity to tell a little bit about our climate story. So um, back in 2017, with my co-founder Ahmed, we started uh, Avoco. It's a smartphone app that lets you photograph your food shopping receipts and track the climate impact of your food purchases. What that was really born out of was, well, youth and well, the population in general feeling that they had no easy way to engage with the climate uh, crisis here in Ireland. So we wanted to try and break it down into like easy everyday steps that people can build into their routine. And for a lot of people, climate crisis is simply overwhelming. So can we start with one small segment of somebody's life and then build the sustainable habits throughout? Um, what we found out pretty quickly that, um, was that, well, we really started as like a, a people power, take back control of your climate impact kind of thing. But what we found out pretty quickly is that you need to look at beyond just the consumers and look at what the businesses are doing too. And that's just, not just from the point of view of um, making sure that we have system change, but it's also from the point of view that bad actors aside, there are a lot of companies out there who really want to take action but simply don't know how to do it. So there's three things that we've kind of learned on our journey. So the first one would be, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. That comes when we're addressing both our business customers and we're addressing individual users. First steps, get momentum and then build on that. Don't ask somebody to make um, unfeasible changes in the beginning, just build momentum. The second thing is we really need a holistic systems wide approach involving all stakeholders. We're looking specifically at the food industry. We're not gonna get the change we need there without linking the consumer movement directly with what's happening on the brand level. And finally, we need to build sustainability tools. There's a huge momentum building, but what we really need to do is provide tools and tangible actions that both consumers and businesses can take um, to help make this green transition happen. So, Thanks for the chance for uh, giving me a chance to share what, what we've learned so far. Thanks so much, Hugh. And from Ireland, we are going all the way to the Philippines. I know, Luis, that DSG asked you not to shoot any arrows, <laughs> but I hope you can shoot some climate messages to our virtual audience today. Oh, well, definitely. And thank you so much, Jayathma, and DSG as well. Um, especially for this platform, because this is such a wonderful opportunity to share about our work. Um, especially here in the Philippines. So let me tell you a little bit about it. We're on a mission to equip farmers with resources they need to establish resilient and sustainable livelihoods here in the Philippines. We're in a time when small communities, especially our aging population of farmers, are vulnerable to the onset of climate change. And I realized that if young people like us didn't do anything, we would live in a future where decent quality food would be a scarcity and a premium. And we would experience food insecurity in as little as 15 years. So I began my venture soon after my town was hit by Typhoon Not 10, which destroyed over 80% of agricultural land in my town that relied so heavily on farming. And this devastation caused by the storm meant that mothers and fathers would struggle to scrap up enough income to put food on the table for months and even years. And the thing is, disasters like these happen every year as a result of climate change with increasing intensity, and people are under-equipped to do something about it. And so I founded my venture with the goal of rebuilding their livelihoods to be more resilient to our climate. 
um, while preserving and harnessing the power of our forests to rethink our food systems. We implemented agroforestry methods and diversified our crops to more resi resilient varieties. At the moment, we're working with over 200 farmers in my town, and we planted over 85,000 productive trees to create economic forests over a span of 85 hectares of land. And through these reforestation efforts, we've increased forest cover, improved soil fertility, and revived two streams in the area. But through this effort, we're also hoping to prove that local youth-led community activities and even the most remote places can have a lasting impact in the race against time for climate action. Thank you so much, Louise, for those reflections. Uh, DSG, I want to come back to you. And over the past few weeks, we've been having multiple conversations with young climate activists and youth climate movements to see how even within the COVID pandemic, we can keep the fire under feet uh, of our policymakers and leaders to bring bold action to climate change. But all of us um, feel a little bit scared and a little bit anxious that with uh, the COVID pandemic and because it's causing a huge damage right now that governments might hit the pause button on their climate commitments um, while they are focusing on saving lives and jobs. Uh, this, how do you feel uh, Nelson, about this and what is... Uh, can you hit mute? Nelson, hit mute. Okay, I'll take it from there. Uh, DSG, as you noted, the pandemic is causing huge damage right now. Are you worried that governments will hit pause on their climate commitments while they force on um, is saving lives and jobs? Thank you, Jasmine. It's a really important question, and it's one that we were very concerned about in the beginning, which is why we brought on the whole issue that there is, as a result of that prescription to suppress the transmission, we are now seeing a pause on, on other issues. So we brought that up to an equal emergency, which is the socioeconomic response and recovery, and to say, you know, climate change hasn't stopped, and so we still need to take those investments um, up front. It's, of course, very difficult when you have a choice of um, either putting out their test kits or treating people with COVID, um, or uh, coming along and saying you're going to do your climate investments. Now, uh, we've made the link to pollution and how much we see um, reducing any regulations on that as we see backslides, that that actually puts your population more at risk because we're seeing actually fatalities in areas where there is most pollution um, higher than others. So we can make the case for that, but I think the right way to go about this is to have your voice out there saying that we need the resources for all of it. We cannot trade off health with um, the, the, health, the health of a person with the health of an environment is one and the same. And so to make that disconnect is a false disconnect and we, we need to keep it together. Um, so I think that's what we're doing right now is to make sure they don't see, uh, they see these as two sides of the, of the same coin. DSG also with COP26, uh, for an example, being postponed, a lot of people are wondering, can we keep the same level of commitment and momentum from governments to adhere to the Paris Agreement and deliver their commitments? Um, what is your take on this and how do you think we can help, especially small and vulnerable countries, um, to uh, better deliver on their commitments, particularly given that COVID-19 is making life even harder for them than before? Well, we are working with the <clears throat> with the um, with the pro the COP president to make sure whatever announcements are made, they are conditional to keeping the momentum and the track that we had. We may be delaying the the postponement of a meeting, but that if you stop this action, doesn't delay climate change. And so we will keep the momentum on all the things that we've promised in the calendar of events that we've had and celebrating or calling to action on Earth Day is just one of those. It's reigniting that movement to make sure the actions that we take. Taking, for instance, the NDCs. We do not stop on the target date that's been set for quality NDCs by the end of this year. And you should hold our feet to, to asking how many have we got? So far, I think there's four that have been banked with UNFCCC. That's a far cry from where we need to be. So push um, on that. Um, and again, as I said, you need to connect with um, the key stakeholders, the decision makers. Uh, it is difficult to do it in this new way of working, um, but there is ingenuity in the, in the youth um, constituency and I know that you can make that happen. Um, one doesn't want to be an activist at my age uh, giving you suggestions because I think you've got better ones, but 
you use a mobile phone, you know how to block a phone with a message that says, until you listen to me, you're not going to be free to do very much else. Um, it's the same with, as you say, the digital mar march that we take online. Be specific and tailored, country by country, what you do um, with business, uh, what you do with government. Uh, and let me tell Olumide, you know, we both come from the same country. We have a crisis because the oil prices have dropped and we have a glut. But is this an opportunity for you now to talk about alternatives to funding uh, to, from the fossil fuel industry, that we can go back to the land, that we can do things uh, that are greener um, and that, that would have a better, um, a better effect on our economies um, and the future that we have. Thank you so much, DSG. And um, we want to reassure you that the youth climate movement will be uh, taking these uh, call to actions forward. But at the same time, um, we would like to take some questions from you to the youth speakers um, to see how the youth movement can and contribute to the efforts that you and the UN is leading. Uh, so the floor is yours, DSG, if you have any question for our youth speakers. Uh, yeah, I mean, they've, they've written these questions down for me, but I'm not sure that they're the ones I'm going to ask. Um, so let me first of all break that rule. Um, and, and two questions I have for you. One is about the here and now. Uh, and the UN tries to make sure that we keep the space open, we convene for voices to come to the fore, and the SG has tried to put his voice out there. What is it that we are not doing? What is it that you would like to hear us do? Um, and be as provocative as you like, because you're not going to get this opportunity very soon, except maybe online. But really say that, because I'd like to take that message back, from, uh, back to him. The second question I have is that COVID has pressed a pause button um, for us to reflect. And we need to take that opportunity. Um, we keep talking about the future and, and your generation. Um, but the future's here now. You, whatever actions we take now are going to determine what happens afterwards. Post COVID is never going to make, this world is not gonna be the same again. Yeah. Are you going to determine and shape that future post COVID, making the demands of governance, technology, cities, the way in which you consume and we produce? Um, I mean, are there, are there things that you are thinking about post COVID? Are you reflecting on that future or are you just waiting for it to happen to you? Thank you, DSG. To, to summarize the two questions, the first one was, what would you like the UN to do more and do better in terms of climate action? And number two is, how will you shape and lead the post-COVID world? So first, I'm going to go to Leah, Leah Namgorova from Uganda. Leah, would you like to take on these two very important and provoking questions from DSG? Um, thank you so much to DSG and everyone. Good evening, good afternoon. Um, I would like to respond to the next, to the second question. Before COVID-19, the, the government were focusing on business most, and it's going, and it's going to just double after the COVID-19, and so they're willing to do anything to the expense of saving lives, and which is, which is, which is what we are also looking at in the future. But then, the, the, pandemic that is going on right now is mitigate it's just I mean it's just mitigating a disaster but then the climate crisis is also mitigating a disaster but also saving lives and making people's lives better thank you thank you very much Leah um, anyone else who likes to check the challenge and answer these two questions I think the first question is very important uh, for you to give your feedback to DSG. Um, I can speak more towards the second question as well. Um, so one thing that I've been thinking a lot about is how post COVID, um, a lot of people are going to start to feel uncomfortable um, going to big crowds or going to protests. And I think that that will definitely follow us after this. So one thing that I have been talking more about, and especially in the climate strike movement, is how to make a demonstration and what makes a demonstration. So we're starting to have all these conversations in the climate strike movement, a lot of reflection. So having spirit at protest is really what brings it together. So how can we have all of our actions online? How can we do it socially, digitally? That way we can still have people feeling comfortable to take action but still be able to do it without 
being comfortable in these big crowds. So currently, right now, what a lot of young people we're, we're doing is we're doing digital strikes. Um, the, during the Earth Week, we're going to have the largest digital strike ever that we've ever planned. We're also taking to social media more than ever to call out our politicians, because a lot of our politicians, um, especially here in the United States, our government is doing more than pausing climate action. They're using the pandemic as an excuse to roll back important environmental policies and protections. They're allowing corporations to pollute the air and water because they say it will benefit the economy. So that means that with our activism, we have to start calling out these politicians. And we're doing that a lot through social media. And that will continue after COVID is I think that we're going to use social media as a resource more than we have before. Thank you, Alexandra. Anyone else? Uh, Jai, I, okay. Yes, Anshul, uh, go ahead. If I can just quickly jump in on the first question, I think uh, Alexandria and Leah very well covered the second one. Uh, I think on the first point, there are two areas where I really think um, some help from the United Nations and the international other institutions as well could really help countries like India. Uh, whenever we talk about a green transition, the response that we get from our governments is that we cannot afford it. Um, and that we have to rely on fossil fuel based industries um, and for, you know, uh, generally on, on coal and so on to make sure that we're able to serve a country as big and large and as diverse uh, as India. But I think it's high time now that we start also feeling the pressure uh, to really, while we accept that yes, completely, it is of course a costly transition. But there is nothing stopping us from making a plan to actually make that transition. And I think that's the pressure that we would really appreciate coming in from the international community, especially from the United Nations, from other countries uh, that are a part of the commitments that, that have been made as a part of the Paris Agreement. Uh, because I feel at this point, um, you know, we, we are really falling short. India is among the top three emitters in the world now. And I think, uh, you know, that, that pressure needs to kind of start building as well. And, and I'm saying this with all due respect to the fact that the Indian government and our prime minister have been uh, making an effort, but I think there's a lot more that can be done if we, if we you know, get a little bit more pressure uh, from outside as well. Thank you, Anshul. Um, Hugh or Louis, do, would you have anything okay. uh, to add? Please so be very I, short. I, yes, I just want to add to uh, what uh, my friend just said from India. So looking at the transition he's talking about, I'm looking at transition to low carbon economy, whereby if uh, United Nations can help us to uh, not really enforce, but to put more uh, conversation to our government, uh, whereby they can uh, help us to, you know, uh, help the uh, new uh, businesses that will be coming up to uh, reform business practices. Those are the three points. The second point is to ask, can they help us to engage consumers in, in the solutions they want to be providing? And how can they work with government to make sure that these are transition we are looking at to low carbon emission we actually help us. Thank you. Thank you, Alumide. Uh, I can just jump in quickly on the first point as well. Uh, what you said, Deputy Secretary General, about the world is not going to be the same again, I think was, was really powerful. But where I am, where I'm standing, that message hasn't come true. People are still planning for let's get back to normal, whatever that was. And I really think there's a huge opportunity here for us to choose which industries you want to keep and which ones you want to say goodbye to finally. And if we can, if you can bring that message really directly and clearly to, I suppose, to, go, to governments that this is a chance for us to choose the building blocks we want for the future that we need. And any idea of getting back to normal to be, to be I suppose, um, I'm not going to say scrapped, but to be, to be taken off the table. And as well as that, something that's been really powerful uh, in the current crisis, I'm sure you've all seen uh, Dr. Michael Ryan from the World Health Organization. And when he was asked like, what's the first thing you do in a pandemic? And he talked about urgency, act now. It's better to be fast um, than to be 100% perfect in your response. Is there, and governments around the world have listened to that. People around the world have listened to that. People on every level have, have bought into that kind of message. How can we frame this crisis with the same kind of message that everybody on every level can relate to and understand? Because in my view, that's something that the climate crisis still hasn't been able to capture. Yeah. 
Thank you, Hugh. I think uh, DSG, very key message there. Uh, can we bring the same level of urgency to the climate crisis as well so the government start uh, acting soon? And I think one other key point for the youth is that um, we already had very high levels of youth unemployment rates in the world. And by 2030, we were supposed to create 600 million new jobs for young people. And I think this COVID pandemic and the post-COVID recovery plans are a start fresh point for governments to create greener, new, cleaner jobs for young people because what young people need is clean, dignified jobs. No one wants to work in a coal mine. Um, so uh, we hope DSG that these messages um, will support your work going forward and you can count on our full support and the youth constituencies full support to keep the fire under the feet of our policymakers, as you always say. Any last message, DSG, and then we can wrap it up. I think you've all had the, given us the messages. It's been amazing to, um, to be with you on Earth Day and to really figure out that call to action that can put a, a louder voice, a, more, uh, a bigger voice of solidarity. We have a human crisis right now um, with COVID and it's amazing to see uh, how, much, how many resources are available suddenly um, from you know, trillions overnight in some places, 20% uh, of GDP in other places. Uh, for this crisis. So I think we have to come back to thinking through how to get those resources for the other crisis that people still haven't connected to them and the actions that they must take in order to, to prevent what we see um, coming around the corner. That 1.5 degree world is absolutely urgent. Um, I think the human spirit and solidarity will prevail and will come out the other end better. Um, but I do think that um, the messages of you know, countering the messages of green is not affordable is about us putting those transition plans on. And, and I, I take the message for, you know, don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. It really is important to get in the doorway and then to expand um, and to bring that movement with you. Um, and I'm looking forward very much to the new way of activism online because I think it's really important. But you need to get into the decision makers front rooms. Um, and I would say as we go forward, two things. The consumers are you, so you can make some changes there, uncomfortable ones, but COVID has shown that they can be made. Um, and the second one is that parents around the world are the shareholders. We may not be, as, as young people, you may not be the shareholders, but there are many parents that are. And I think the more young people also talk to our generation on the shareholders ability to go from brown to green would be really important to business. Um, and we, we are seeing a shift in some places, but I think you, you know how to make your parents uncomfortable at home. My kids do a good job of that. So um, it's, it's absolutely energizing to speak to you. I'll take your messages back to the SG. Um, and uh, you know, the, I think the future is incredibly bright. It looks a bit dim right now, but you know, as they say, just let's be um, optimists that, um, that, that, that sell hope, because that's the greatest commodity anyone can have. Thank you so much, DSG. And I think you've finished on uh, such an important point that the future is intergenerational and that we should all come together to, to solve this crisis and many other crises we will potentially face in the future. Thank you, DSG. Thank you to all our amazing youth speakers uh, and to all of those who watched us um, online um, celebrate this Earth Day, but most importantly, make sure to take action. Thank you very much. Be safe.